Thank you very much for being here. The committee will come to order. The Subcommittee on Domestic Policy of the Committee of Oversight and Government Reform uh, is now in order. The hearing will examine the priorities and objectives of the Office of National Drug Control Policy under the Obama Administration and how those goals are reflected in the 2011 fiscal year dr National Drug Control Budget. Without objection, the Chair and Ranking Minority Member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. We're here today to evaluate the Office of National Drug Control Policy's 2011 budget, the first drug budget formed under the Obama administration. President Obama and the Director Kurlikowski have said that the nation's drug policy should be guided by examining the evidence of what works. To that end, they've suggested that drug abuse should be treated as a public health issue instead of a criminal justice issue. Director Kurlikowski has rightfully called for an end to the war on drugs. This is an obviously important shift from the previous administration. The question to be addressed at this hearing today is whether, despite this important rhetorical shift, the ONDCP is in fact engaging in and employing an honest assessment of what works and what does not work in U.S. drug policy. We will ask, does the budget support programs with demonstrated effectiveness for reducing drug use and its harmful health consequences here in the United States? Or does the budget continue to fund a war on drugs that is unsupported by science and research? It's unfortunate that uh, ONDCP was not able to release this year's National Drug Control Strategy or Budget Summary prior to this hearing. Not only have they missed uh, by over two months the February 1 statutory deadline mandated by the 2006 reauthorization, but it's frustrated the subcommittee's ability to conduct oversight. Without the strategy, we're left to speculate to some degree about the administration's approach from the budget highlights and other drug control agency budget documents. From the information available, it's clear that at least in some areas, we're beginning to see drug policy decisions based on science and evidence instead of politics. This is especially true in the area of treatment and international source country programs. The increased funding for treatment programs and commitment to funding addiction screening while falling short of the goal of providing treatment for all who need it reflects the recognition that handling drug addiction as a medical problem is most effective. On the international side, while the budget continues to drastically overspend on failed interdiction policies, at least we're finally seeing a shift in spending in source country programs focusing less on the military side of drug enforcement and crop eradication and more on providing assistance to strengthening the rule of law, democratic institutions, and addressing border security. The budget proposes funds for new demand reduction programs in source countries that have drug problems largely as a result of supplying the U.S. with drugs. These are all positive steps to support evidence-based and cost-effective drug policy. But if the administration truly acknowledges the plethora of research demonstrating that treatment and evidence-based prevention are more effective at reducing drug use than law enforcement interdiction and source country eradication, then why, um, uh, uh, then why is our drug budget still so lopsided in favor of less effective approaches? If we compare the current budget requests for supply-side and demand-side programming to the previous administration's last drug budget in 2009, the difference in spending for supply reduction in the upcoming fiscal year is only one half of one percent. The 2011 budget still spends at least two-thirds of the total drug budget on supply reduction programs because the drug budget still fails to comprehensively account for all federal drug control expenditures as required by the 2006 Reauthorization Act, uh, despite the subcommittee and congressional ordered reviews, repeated calls for ONDCP to follow the law, the misguided and unsupported orientation of supply-side efforts is actually more. The drug budget is calculated now contains only those expenditures aimed at reducing drug use rather than those associated with the consequence of drug use. For example, the budget fails to account for the billions of dollars a year spent on prosecuting and incarcerating drug offenders. Congress has clearly spoken on this issue, and we hope that this administration will work quickly to 
we introduce a budget methodology that actually communicates to Congress and the public the levels of public uh, spending on drug policy. Uh, I'm going to ask um, uh, unanimous consent to just put the rest of my statement in the record. Mr. Jordan, you thank, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and it's good to have the director with us again. Uh, and I appreciate the director's response to a letter that many of us had sent to him and, and, and detailed response, fairly detailed response that he sent back to us. Um, Mr. Kucinich, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, our nation continues to face a drug problem that takes lives, brings about violence, and tears apart communities and families. We need to take every opportunity and make every effort to eliminate this problem with an approach that focuses both on keeping drugs from entering the country in the first place and curbing addiction here at home. The Office of National Drug uh, Control Policy has an extremely difficult task in coordinating many different agencies to address issues at home and abroad. The ONDCP budget must strike a balance between funding programs to tackle both international and domestic supply reduction, demand reduction at home, drug-related violence along our borders and in our streets, addiction treatment and health-related issues stemming from abuse of both illicit and prescription drugs, and enforcement of our drug laws and punishment of those who are in violation. Regional disparities mean different drugs are more readily available to be bought, sold, and abused in different states, compounding the challenge of creating one budget and one strategy for the entire country. For example, methamphetamines are a growing problem, especially in rural areas all over the country, and I've seen the detrimental effects of this drug in our home state of Ohio. My colleagues from districts along the southwest border have seen increases in spillover violence as Mexican drug cartels have become more brazen and moved operations further north towards Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. The many domestic and international factors that contribute to our drug problem necessitate a strategy that addresses both supply and demand, reduction initiatives, eradication of drug crops in source countries, interdiction, domestic anti-drug campaigns, and treatment programs must all be a part of a successful national strategy. The last time Director Kurlikowski testified before this subcommittee, he had been on the job for only a few days. As a result of our budget process, during his first year at ONDCP, the director operated largely under the framework of a budget and strategy prepared by the Bush administration. I especially look forward to hearing about the director's experiences at ONDCP and what his expectations are for the future of the office during the Obama administration, including what changes to the budget he is seeking and how the national strategy will change to reflect the goals of the current administration. I'm only sorry that we could not have postponed this hearing until the ONDCP national strategy had been released, but hope that we may have another opportunity to speak with the director once the strategy has been finalized. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the time. I thank Mr. Uh, Mr. Jordan. Uh, Mr. Foster, you have an opening statement. Yeah. I, I'd just like to make one brief comment. Is when you're optimizing a budget, you, it's very important to understand what it is you're optimizing for. And I think that what the starting point for this discussion should be, you know, what is it that we're optimizing for? It seems to me that it ought to be something like the number of man years lost to, um, to drug abuse in this country. And that um, then you can look at the entire um, range of things that we spend money on and find out which contributes the most of that. So I'll be very interested in how you set up the framework for optimizing that, all of our expenditures. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you very much. I want to introduce uh, Mr. Kurlikowski, who's the sole witness on the first panel. He's the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. In this capacity, Mr. Kurlikowski coordinates all aspects of federal drug control programs and implementation of the President's National Drug Control Strategy. Mr. Kurlikowski brings nearly four decades of law enforcement and drug policy experience to the position, most recently serving nine years as Chief of Police for the Seattle Police Department. He also served as Deputy Director for the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, and President of the Major Cities Chiefs Association. I want to thank you for appearing before the subcommittee today. Mr. Kurlikowski, it is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Uh, Mr. Kurlikowski, I'd ask that you give a brief summary of your testimony and to keep uh, this summary under five minutes in duration. Your complete written statement will be included in the record of the hearing, and I ask that you begin. And, yeah, pull that mic up close, okay? I I'm just going to say that uh, uh, rather than to trouble future witnesses, uh, staff should be instructed to make sure that every witness is prepared to testify, including uh, demonstrating to them the appropriate use of the, of the microphone. Thank you very much. Good. You may proceed. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Jordan for the opportunity to testify. And I am happy to return back to the committee. Uh, and uh, I was only on the job a few days, and uh, it's been an exciting year, quite frankly. Uh, I look forward to the discussion. I look forward to answering your questions. The Obama administration understands that addiction is a disease. The prevention, treatment, and law enforcement must be included as part of a comprehensive strategy to stop drug use, to get help to those who need it, and to ensure public safety. The public health consequences of drug use are enormous, and the public safety impact of drug use is equally dramatic. Drug overdoses now outnumber gunshot deaths in America. They are fast approaching motor vehicle crashes as the leading cause of accidental death. Since I last appeared before the committee, I have been focused on drawing attention to a series of problems. Uh, one in particular is drugged driving. And results from the Monitoring the Future study uh, indicate that in 2008, more than 10 percent of high school seniors admitted to having driven a vehicle after smoking marijuana in the two weeks prior to the survey. This is a troubling statistic that is consistent with data from the Department of Transportation study that was released in December last year. I've also been focused on raising awareness about prescription drug abuse. Uh, prescription drug abuse harms the people who misuse these pills as well as those close to them. And while we must ensure access to medications that alleviate suffering, it is also vital that we do all we can to curtail diversion and abuse of pharmaceuticals. Moreover, between 1997 and 2007, treatment admissions for prescription painkillers increased more than 400 percent. These issues, as well as a renewed focus on the importance and effectiveness of smart prevention, are reflected in the soon-to-be-released 2010 National Drug Control Strategy. The inaugural strategy commits the Obama administration to reduce drug use and its consequences. It's based on common sense, sound science, and practical experience. And the President's fiscal year 2011 National Drug Control Budget lays the foundation for our efforts. It contains requests totaling $15.5 billion, an increase of $521 million over the FY 2010 enacted level. The resources are categorized around five major functions, substance abuse prevention, substance abuse treatment, domestic law enforcement, interdiction, and international partnerships. And overall, the budget request for prevention and treatment represents a 6.5 percent increase over fiscal year 2010 enacted level. The budget also includes $151.3 million for the five priorities established by ONDCP and our federal partners working together as part of the Demand Reduction Interagency Work Group. Let me summarize those five priorities. Creating a national, community-based prevention system to protect adolescents, training and engaging the primary health care system to intervene in the emerging cases of drug abuse, expanding and improving integ integrating addiction treatment into the federal health care systems, developing safe and efficient ways to manage drug-related offenders, and creating a community-based drug monitoring system. However, our renewed focus on prevention and treatment does not come at the expense of effective law enforcement. And we are committed to a balanced approach that places as much emphasis on enforcement as it does on treatment and prevention. Over $3.9 billion is included in the fiscal year 2011 budget request for domestic law enforcement efforts, an increase of $73.8 million over the fiscal year 2010 level. With the forthcoming strategy and added resources, we will we'll take a comprehensive and balanced approach, combining tough but fair enforcement with robust prevention and treatment efforts, and that we will be successful in stemming both the demand for and supply of illegal drugs in our country. I look forward to continuing to work with the committee's members to address these challenging and important issues. I recognize that none of the many things ONDCP and my executive branch colleagues want to accomplish would not be possible without the support of the members of Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kurlikowski. Um, all of our witnesses uh, who will address this committee today agree that the previous administration's supply-side programs were, were not effective in stopping supply or consumption of drugs in the U.S. Uh, given the evidence, Mr. Kurlikowski, why the supply-side reduction programming 
continue to receive so much budget emphasis? I think that the supply side uh, 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 emphasis is important for a host of reasons. Whether we talk about eradication, whether we talk about our international partners and where drugs are flowing, no longer uh, being uh, no longer America being just the sole point of destination for example cocaine. As America's appetite has diminished for cocaine, the appetite in the UK and Europe for cocaine increases. So these supply side uh, uh, interdiction efforts, uh, international partnerships, helping to reduce the, uh, the use of drugs and the amount of drugs, even in the most impoverished nations, uh, as was highlighted in Sunday's New York Times Magazine, are critically important and we have to be a strong partner with them. Well, where's the evidence, though? I mean, describe to this committee specifically sure. with statistics what evidence you have that uh, this approach has been effective. You get a lot of money. You put more money in the budget. Tell me about the effectiveness. I want you to test to the effectiveness of the last administration's uh, supply-side programs. Colombia. I would uh, cite Colombia. There is a level of... Uh, safety and security in the country. There is increased productivity uh, uh, among the citizens. Uh, I would show that, that... That's anecdotal. Do you have any okay. specific uh, statistics that you can point to? Th that I would tell you that everything I know after four decades in law enforcement tells me that we have to have a balanced approach. I think the increased... But I, you know, I appreciate your experience. Okay. I mean, you've served the country well, and you've served uh, the city of Seattle. I'm familiar with your service there. Uh, give me some numbers. I would give you the numbers that, uh, uh, that are probably most effective when it comes to the reduced number of uh, amount of violence that's occurred in some of these other countries. For instance, Colombia. You certainly can't cite Mexico at that point when it is reduced levels of violence, but I think in the coming years with the strategy that President Calderon has done and the support of the United States government that you will see increased safety and security, and that can be reflected in violent crime numbers in that country also. And I know the devastation that the drugs cause. In Mexico, really? Yes. Tell me more. I, I would, uh, this is, I've, I've had in less than a year my third trip to Mexico. I've had uh, three and now soon to be followed by four uh, trips to the southwest border. I think that they are making progress in, in taking on these transnational organized crime and, uh, and drug cartels. So, so, what, so what parts of your budget are the most effective and, and cost effective in reducing illicit drug use? I, I think that is the question that everyone would like to see answered. Well, that's the one I'm asking and, you, and, and you're the director. You want to give it a try? Right. I, I, I certainly am happy to give it a try. And I would tell you that it is the uh, money that goes into prevention and treatment, because we know that's effective. But I would also tell you that it is extremely difficult, and I think that will be buttressed by other witnesses, to get your head and your arms around what the federal drug budget is and what it means. If people tell me that money that goes to law enforcement has nothing to do with reducing demand, I would tell them they're wrong. But that has been a debate that has gone on. Trying to segregate this drug budget into a supply only or a demand only and which one is more effective has stymied the economists and the researchers and the academics for many, many years and continues to do so. But we're making some progress at trying to refine better measures. So, so can you tell the subcommittee what are the most cost-effective approaches that you're using? The most cost-effective approaches would be in prevention, and the most cost-effective approaches would be in treatment. That's if generally speaking, though. Can you be specific about what your strategy is with respect to employing cost-effective approaches? Sure. The cost-effective approach would be uh, the $151 uh, million dollars that the President has requested to do uh, something called prevention-prepared communities. As compared to what? As compared to the uh, drug-free communities. Uh, uh, that, we, uh, that we currently fund at about $125,000. Those are positive programs. The prevention prepared communities are ones that have greater amount, or will, if they're enacted, will have greater amounts of money 
going to communities, using evidence-based, science-based prevention programs. And for every dollar that we can invest in prevention and who we can prevent from becoming a drug addict or a user of drugs that causes a drain on society and a, and a horrible problem to their family, that makes sense, Mr. Th Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, Chair, recognize Mr. Jordan. Five minutes. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of your $400 million budget, what, what percentage, uh, Director, is is supply oriented? What percentage is demand oriented? And you can, you, you can. You can and and I'm, 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 I'm happy to I mean, tell you. You said, you said both are important. Is it 50 50? Is it more on the. But then you also talked about prevention and treatment. Is it lean more to that direction or? It leans, it's much more on supply. Okay. Uh, the, the, money, uh, the monies are much more on supply. Yeah. But I would go back to that earlier statement that it's pretty hard to get your head around exactly what the supply problem and, and what the, uh, the supply amount is. But it does lean more heavily toward the supply interdiction enforcement. Okay, let me, let me ask just kind of a broad question. You can take as much time as you want, and I'll try to make this my only one, although we <laughs> typically have a habit of interrupting you as you, you go along. Um, I mean, Americans are concerned about drug use, drug abuse, they're concerned about the link of the drug trade with gang activity, particularly the folks in the Southwest, but I get it. I get these comments in Ohio as well when I'm out and about our district. Uh, the link with gang activity, potentially terrorist activity, um, illegal immigration. So how does your, give this committee an idea of how your $400 million budget, how you work with Justice, DEA, Border Patrol, how does, you know, because again, I'm, I also talk with a lot of folks back home who say, you know, we spend money on all things. It seems like there's a lot of overlap. And it, how does it work? And, and, and with the other agencies who also have an, a, a big say in that, that same kind of, because as I talk to folks back home, families and business owners, that's kind of their general concern. When they think about the drug things they read about in the paper and the things they see on their nightly news, that seems to be their concern. So tell me how that, that, how that works and how it relates. And specifically, sure. I, I know staff has pointed out that the Justice Department is looking at, at cutting the Southwest Border Prosecutors Initiative. Pro so kind of tie that in together if you can, and I'll, I'll attempt not to interrupt you and let you talk. Okay. We actually have um, an incredibly good working relationship. There were agencies that had not been over to ONDCP in a, in a pretty good number of years. For instance, representatives from the Department of Education. We established very quickly, and some of it went on clearly before I, uh, I was even confirmed, we established an interagency work group. 135 other federal partners, uh, high-level officials within the Department of Justice, HHS, et cetera, to attack this stuff comprehensively and to look at it in a, in a very balanced way. And bringing the Department of Justice, for instance, we meet uh, almost every month, bringing the Department of Justice, whether it's DEA, the Department of Homeland Security groups that, uh, that are all affected, for instance, the example would be the Southwest Border Strategy. Here's a strategy that encompasses all of these different equities and makes sure that everyone is playing well in the sandbox, that people are cooperating, that people are supporting each other, and that people aren't just looking toward their own very narrow lane. And I have seen great success in the, in the effect of attempting to and working toward reducing the number of guns going into Mexico, looking at uh, bulk cash, but also the increases in the, along the southwest border where we have actually stopped more drugs uh, from coming in. As you know, we have a lot of other issues on our plate. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think Governor Strickland has put together in Ohio a task force on prescription drugs. We know that the, uh, the amount of deaths in this country is being spiked by prescription drugs. Those aren't being manufactured in another country. Those aren't coming, those aren't being smuggled right. in. We know that methamphetamine uh, laboratory uh, seizures have increased particularly uh, in the last year. California is still the number one uh, preparer of, of methamphetamine. A lot of that is not being smuggled in from another country. It is being manufactured right here. We have to reduce demand within, uh, within the United States. We have to prevent young people from doing this. And we have to make sure that every dollar, every, every very important tax dollar that is spent is used in the most effective manner. 
and that's this and that's the, the the terrific part of this job is being able to bring all of those equities together to say what's important how do we do it and how do we make sure that uh, that we're not being redundant and overlapped and i think we're making some great progress yeah thank you mr chairman thank you very much mr jordan chair recognizes <coughs> mr foster thank you um i wonder if you, you could help me at um Describing what efforts have been made to quantify the relative cost effectiveness of the various anti-drug programs, we've convened one one of the things that uh, that that is in the strategy, and there's certainly no secrets in the president's strategy, and uh, and it will be released very quickly. Uh, but one of the one of the the chapters deals with the lack of adequate measures, numbers, metrics that have existed and continue to exist. Also the timeliness of the information and the, and the data. So we have convened several groups to take a look at that and try and figure out some effective measures. We know, for instance, one, the number of uh, admissions to treatment centers, the number of uh, hospital emergency room admissions. We also know that some of this data is woefully either inadequate or late getting there. So we brought these folks together and we've asked them to help us work together to design a series of measures that cut across the medical community, the uh, law enforcement community, for instance, who comes into the different jails in this country and what are the effects of, what, uh, of drugs that they may be under. And, that's, uh, uh, and, and these are all going to be important measures. All right, but is the intention to put in place something where you can say, okay, we can buy one more helicopter for this country and it's going to result in this many this many fewer hospital admissions or any any attempt to I, try to track it all the way through so you can i think i i think a lot smarter people uh, uh, than I have, have worked hard at trying to do that to say what's the most effective uh, use. Is it in the media campaign to keep young people? Is it in the uh, uh, buying more uh, uh, aerial eradication in another country, et cetera? Um, I think President Truman, when he, when he talked about having all the economists lined up end to end, said, wouldn't that be a beautiful sight? And uh, uh, it, it, I have had great difficulty understanding some of these issues myself. We are working hard to try and do that. I doubt if we will ever be to a point in this country where we can say that X amount of money going here to, to this country will result in a safer society within the United States. I, I just don't think we'll get there. I think we'll move closer, but we're not there. Yeah, but even a very imperfect analysis can catch an error. If you're, you're making a, a mistake by a factor of 10 in where you put your money, then you don't need a perfect analysis to identify that you should shift your money. Um, and another area that concerns me is is research and development and the balance of effort. Um, there are things we're making tremendous progress in understanding the the effects of drugs in the brain, and it is not at all unthinkable that within you know 10, 20, 30 years, you know we will have um, medical um, things that reverse that reverse addiction. And I think that you know this is obviously a huge payoff R and D. And I was wondering, do you also balance the the research and development? You know, both from well, the the two research and development things are, are first off, you know, biomedical R and D, and the other one is advanced screening methods. Um, simply just to have cheaper ways to test more people for a wider spectrum of drugs faster. For when people are in programs, they're supposed to be drug free. If it was free to test them automatically every 10 minutes, then you know that would actually make enforcement and and keeping them in the programs easier. And so those two technical ways sure. or other ways, how do you balance the research and development with the? I would tell you that uh, that uh, going back to the last part of your question first, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment is a program called Espert. It essentially teaches healthcare professionals uh, that to to ask all of their patients, regardless of what they are being. Uh, treated for or talked about to ask several questions about their alcohol and their uh, drug use and that the answers to those questions can actually lead to an early intervention which is more effective and less costly. 85 to 90 percent of the of the drug treatment research in the world is done by the United States and is done through uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. We are strong supporters of NIDA and the uh, and the NIDA budget uh, when it comes to this. That's why I think the uh, discussion about cocaine vaccine uh, that is uh, 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 being looked at very closely. 
the uh, scans that have been done to show the effects of, uh, of addiction on the brain to actually show it as a disease rather than a moral failure has taken us a, a, a long way forward. I think we also have a, a, a more important task, particularly in a role that, that I get to play because I'm not a scientist, I'm certainly not an economist, but I get to tell people that addiction is a disease rather than a moral failure. And once we start looking at it and rolling it into the primary health care, uh, which President Obama has done, I think we'll make further progress. Okay. Thank you. My time's up. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Reiser. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing. And uh, I, I have to first start off by uh, by having an unusual one for the minority. I'd like to thank you for a very deep